Hey, Bikeholics, Hero 3D has a wide variety of innovative products for your Harley-Davidson and a brand new line for the all-new Honda Goldwing named Gold Strike. Top quality, affordable chrome lighting and comfort products, Zero Gold Strike are the motorcycle LED lighting innovators for CAN bus plug-and-play system compatibility. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com forward slash store. Check out our full line of Zero 3D products. Got us an email, Lurch, in the house with me here. He, uh, I think you handled this. I will handle this, uh, but, but you did handle. This. I did handle this, and I will handle this. But you know, somewhere out there, and and I'm talking to you, the guy that just went, "I like gold." Mm-hmm. I know you did it because yeah, I yeah. didn't do it on that one. And some there's a few people listening to this right now that just said it to themselves in their car. It's very true, or on their bike, or on their lawnmower, or on their treadmill. Yes. So we got us an email. This is from Bill Hominick. His question was, he says, "I just uh, installed new handlebars on my 2020 HD Ultra Limited to eliminate leaning forward and experiencing back pain." Now, in turning hard because of the spread of the grips, my arm going furthest doesn't always allow full lock. Do you have a suggestion or another on another handlebar? Thanks. So here, here's my answer. Uh, taller and wider bars often always make it difficult to lock turn a bike. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, other bars that make it easier to do that are going to be you know in a position like an a ping or whatever. So my suggestion was, is, and this is what we do, just move forward, choke up on the tank, and then you'll be able to make that lock turn. It's not a position you'd be sitting in all the time, but if you know you're going slow and you need to make a really tight turn, just slide forward, get up on that tank, and lock yep. your bars. On the Dyna Lowrider S, because it's got some you know, 14 apes on it, and I sit back on it as it is, I have to do that if I'm going to bar lock. But if you're going to be doing a lot of that, you'd want to just get regular handlebars. Right. You know what I mean? Um yeah, I think it was a good answer. You, you put the bars on that are comfortable for you to cruise most of the time, and that's mostly what you're doing. Right. So it, it's easier to just cheat and suck up on that tank and and uh, make your lock turn when you need to, but then the rest of the time have the comfortable bars. Yeah, and it's definitely harder doing it anyways with your hands way up there. You just don't have as much control, uh, so to speak. Without so, a doubt. Without a doubt, than the, like the stock smaller bars like on a Street Glide uh, special like I have or something like that. So there you go. Good. Yep. Shop pay installments integrated in the law abiding biker store, guys. You uh, now have the option to buy products right now, knowing you can pay in four equal payments interest free. So uh, use that over there if you like. Want to ride longer? Tired of a sore and achy ass? Then fix it with a high quality butt buffer seat cushion. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com for slash store and check out our full lineup of butt buffer seat cushions. Oh, yeah. Once you've used Rick Rack, You'll never go back. The ultimate motorcycle luggage rack solution. Forget those messy straps and bungee cords. Go strapless with a Rick Rack quick attach luggage system and quality bag. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com forward slash store and get hooked up now. You already know Lurch is in the house with me. That's right. Mm hmm. That's right. Get this thing kicked off. Welcome back, you freaking bikeaholics. This is the podcast for the motorcycle majority, the Big MM, also known as the 99%. By listening, you are part of what we call the hashtag. Biker revolution. Mm-hmm. We do have just one question for you before we get started. What are you waiting for, Bikeaholics? Mount up and let us take you on another wild-ass ride. There you go, guys. Getting right into it. Ryan Erlacher here, your host of the Law Abiding Biker Podcast, and of course, your... High-tech redneck. That's right. So we got a special episode for you guys today. Uh... We got some things up front, but I want to let you know uh, what the main topic is, and it is Lurch officially retiring from law enforcement. Yeah, I think we've talked about it on a few uh, episodes, but we really haven't dug into my law enforcement career. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Yep. And then transitioning out of that into civilian life, if you will, and how things are going uh, now that I'm a full employee of lab. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so it should be, uh, exciting. We'll kind of go through that. Um, and, uh, I got a lot of questions and that's stuff I know anyways, but, um, yeah, so that should be, uh, a lot of fun. I want to talk about one new free video that uh, is out. We try to mention those when we can, and that was my police motorcycle qualify qualification skills course and inside look. It was just a quick video I did and, uh, you can get it in the show notes, lawabidingbiker.com forward slash whatever episode number this is, is how you can get that. And uh, there you go. We want to thank the following people because we love our sponsors. Of course, our paying sponsors, love them. They support the show, but these folks also are a direct reason uh, that we are able to bring these episodes to you. We got Dennis Christensen of Little Canada, Minnesota. 
Marilyn Castillo of La Habra, California, and Tim Hildebrand of Powell, Wyoming, and Tim is top tier. Mm, Todd Godine of Houston, Texas, top tier. Jimmy Nichols of Rogers, Arkansas, and Todd Weber of Sterling, Colorado, top tier. Bert Rinder of Bethesda, Maryland, top tier. Donald Doss of Texas City, Texas, and Matthew Bardo of Canton, Ohio. There you go, lawabidingbiker.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You basically pledge a certain amount per piece of content. No risk because you can put a monthly cap. There are benefits such as t-shirt stickers, the private Facebook group. It's a troll-free zone. You get podcast episodes early, uh, live video broadcast and chat when we do those, and uh, up to access to our premium videos up on request. And of course, the ride, meetup, and events. Access to those guys because they are going on uh, as we speak in the private Facebook group. So yeah, if you want to get signed up, you can get access to that. So here I sit with Lurch. Uh, he is the, uh, um, now, now uh, to, to do a little backstory, um, we've been doing this for quite a few years now. And I think it was after the first year or so, um, I realized that I needed some help. And uh, mm-hmm. I, at that time, I basically, tur- we were doing the podcast mostly, and uh, I was doing some videos, um, but just running not at a, the level you're with doing a handy now. cam. Yeah. yeah, you know, I didn't even know what YouTube hardly was. You know, uh, uh, what seven, eight years ago, something yeah, like that. At least eight, Thir- I think. Thirteen, yeah, so eight. Um, so uh, Lurch had obviously been on the podcast um, along with others, and uh, I asked him if he would. He was working obviously as a full time law enforcement officer, Leo. And uh, I asked him, hey, I need some help uh, with this thing, um, audio editing specifically, and uh, um, and then the social media side and aspect of it. And uh, so... I think you just had to pester me until I finally gave in, because I know I wasn't uh, I wasn't sure about it at first. Really? Yeah. Uh, just, you know, just the amount of time it might take and what's involved. You know, I'm fairly technical, but at that time, I didn't know how to edit any audio. Right. Right. So I was a little apprehensive about it, but you wore me down. I did. You think was it like that? Yeah, <laughs> a it little may, bit. It may have been a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, it may have bit. been. It's funny uh, going back and trying to re- remember the different uh-huh. things. You know. Um, well, I'm glad I gave in because it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome to hear. And I, at that time, basically trained uh, Lurch um, using an audio editor, um, Adobe mm-hmm. Audition. Yep. Right? Yep. That's the one. Yep. Um, and to to kind of get the get the right sound i guess we have a formula mm-hmm. and uh how the to, secret sauce the secret sauce yes and uh how to get that on there and then how to um cut pieces and chunks out that you don't like and things like that so uh yeah trained them up and uh ever since then uh, even working uh you know as a full-time leo um like most of us do around here he was doing that on the side part-time wasn't full-time and uh gave a lot Gave a lot doing all that over the years, and uh, so that he is the uh, audio editor now for and has been and still is uh, to this day. Um, but now, obviously, that he uh, has retired, um, and we've just grown uh, quite a bit over the years. Um, I decided to bring him on, and he decided it was a you know a discussion uh, on as chief operations officer because we have the store side too, and Big Daddy Kane. Um, down there that runs the store. He's the store operations manager, but uh, Lurch is kind of in between all of it, and so to speak. Um, so yeah, uh, that that's kind of the, the a little bit of the background of, of Lurch coming into Law Abiding Biker Media. Yeah, you I, got. I, well, I remember sitting down with you when it was time I was eligible to retire, and we we're looking at um, me coming on, and it's something you and I had been talking about for quite a while. Uh, and we've been friends for a long time, but still it was, a um, for me anyways, a little bit of an awkward kind of conversation, you know, talking about, um, money more than, more than mm-hmm. anything salary, you know, it's talking about salary with friends and, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a little bit awkward, but, but, uh, uh, we got through it, figured something out and we're making it happen now. We did. It was just, it was just strange. It may, it's kind of maybe for people out there, they're going, well, why was it awkward? Right. We were friends for so long and we've been talking about this, but when you had to sit down and talk about money and, you know, it's not like it was really a job interview. Right. It was just, here's Ryan, here's what I'd like to make in order to retire. And you had to think about whether or not the company can afford it. Right. So, you know, anytime there's money involved with friends, it's always a little bit, bit awkward. 
Yep. No, I. But agree. we got through it, and I'm I'm easily accepting the paycheck now. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not awkward at all. Yeah, when it gets to you on time, right? Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah, we we tease about that because I I I misentered a date and uh it was a little bit late, but uh, Lurch is good with it. Um. <laughs> so he's got to probably bust my chops about. Well, luckily, that. I've got that retirement coming in, so you know I can always count on that. Yeah. Right. Right. So at some point. Um, obviously uh, we know what point Lurch decided, uh, I think it was, tell, tell me about the, that kind of how long it took you to finally say, I'm going to retire. Uh, well, for, for me, it, uh, I mean, I knew the date I, I, I worked for the Washington state patrol and that's one thing that I've never been able to really say before because, uh, in law enforcement, if you have, um, off duty jobs or outside jobs, generally speaking, your department has a policy that, uh, doesn't allow you to represent them uh, in your off duty employment. So, uh, in the podcasts, uh, I would usually just, we would never be specific about where I worked, but, uh, so for those who didn't, know, I worked for the Washington state patrol for 25 years and, uh, they have a, um, 25 year retirement. So regardless of age, and I was lucky I hired on at 21, uh, you can retire for 25 years of service. So I got to, um, my 25 in December of 2020. And uh, I still, but I was locked into a lease uh, up in Wenatchee. I was a district captain, commander up there in Wenatchee, and I was locked into a lease. And I talked about maybe going in December, but my wife had a really good point. She said, moving in December sucks. Why don't you just wait till spring? Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, I I went in June because um, when when it comes to retirements, at least mine in, in, in the state of Washington, in order to be eligible for a cost of living increase, you have to be retired for at least a year. So by going in June, you you'll, you um, you minimize the amount of time it takes before you're eligible for a cola. So I'll be eligible for a cola this July. If I would have went after June, went in July, I would have had to do that year plus another. Gotcha. So yeah, that's always confusing. Yeah, that whole cost. You, you hear these old guys talking about retirement when you're young, you're, and it just goes right over your head. I wish I would have paid a little more attention when I was younger. Yeah, right, right. So that's the cost of living, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. COLA, what's it stand for? Cost, cost of, living? of living allocation, maybe? Allocation, all right. And do you, do you get that each year? It, it's not guaranteed. Okay. Um, it's, it's based on the um, consumer price index, I think, out of Seattle and a few other cities. But it just depends on on the economy and what's going on. And it could be, you know, uh, nothing. I think the cap, the max is 3%, I think, is most it can it can gain, but... Right. It, it varies from year to year. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And the reason Lurch was uh, in a lease up there, if you guys wonder why, um, he was working, we're going to get into some of that. Yeah. He was working away from where he actually lives. And No, I was living in Wenatchee. I just yeah. went home and visited my wife on the weekends. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, we'll get it, into some specifics. But more than, it, it, I had my time in and I was living away from home. It was time to come home and... uh I had a good opportunity to come home and work for you full time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, so let's just start from back when. Lurch, the darn. Yeah. We need it. We need it. But I don't got it. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. So taking it back a bit, uh, basically tell us how you got into law enforcement at 21. Uh, you know, I'd like to give you some some inspirational reason why I joined and uh, maybe I found that a little bit later, but to be honest in, in the beginning, I just thought it'd be a cool ass job. You know, um, I, I was particularly drawn to the, the state patrol just because of the image that the patrol has. Um, the patrol is very paramilitaristic. Uh, the cars are, are clean. They're all white with a sim- with simple um, decals. The, you know, the, the uh, troopers always carried them themselves um, very well. And the uniforms look good. And I had some interactions with a few, uh, troopers when I was young. Um, one of the youth, um, he's not a youth pastor, but one of the youth leaders at my brother's church uh, was a trooper and Mm. got to know him quite a bit and was just drawn to it. Um, also growing up in the church, uh, when I was younger, um, you know, helping others and being of service uh, was something that I enjoyed. I think you can get a lot of pleasure from helping others, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it definitely makes you feel good helping others. At least it does me anyway. So I was kind of kind of drawn to it. I was a fairly intelligent kid when it came to school, but I didn't enjoy school. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, me. Same. Yeah. And and so my parents uh, said if I went to the local community college here in Yakima, it's uh, Yakima Valley Community College, also referred to as the University of Knob Hill, because mm-hmm. it's on Knob Hill mm-hmm. Boulevard. Uh, but they said they'd pay for a couple of years. And uh, I, I got a, I went and got a criminal justice degree. And this, this is one thing I'll say for anybody that's interested in a career in law enforcement. Do not go get a criminal justice degree. Right. Because it's worth nothing after you retire. In fact, I remember one of my counselors who was a police chief out here in, in Sela. He said, Matt, you really should get a business degree. Mm-hmm. I said, I don't, I'm not going to be no businessman. I want, I'm going to be a cop. Right. You know, I, I want, so I, stick, I stuck with the criminal justice degree. I wish I would have done business, just a general business degree. Because every law enforcement agency ran like a business. Mm-hmm. But I, in that, at that time, at 21 years old, I didn't see myself in the position I ended up with. I thought I'd be on the road being a trooper for the whole time. I, didn't, I wasn't looking, looking farther down the road. But if you get a general business degree, that'll help you run the agency because police agencies are run like a business. And then afterwards, you've got that degree to rely on too in your career after law enforcement. Yeah. That's always a good point. I've told people the same thing. Yeah, if you're going to get a degree to get it in something else, even if it's not business or whatever. But yeah, the criminal justice degree is not going to help you a lot, um, except in the and really, you get like two uh, percent um, yeah. depending on the agency if you have the two year degree, mm-hmm. regardless of what it is. Mm-hmm. So get something outside. You know, I think being like a reserve police officer or something like that is is very helpful. You don't get an increase for that, but for getting the job. Right, you know, maybe more than a degree. And some departments require degrees, but n- not very many around here require a degree. And th- th- do you know of any? Uh, there are some, but not not many. They're usually the smaller departments. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess just to kind of wrap that all up, I was drawn to it because of the service and helping others. Um, but I also thought it'd be fun, um, you know, driving fast and chasing down criminals, chasing bad and, guys, yeah, and just seemed like a fun career. Young it, man's it, game. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. So I guess the excitement drew me to it and, and then just the service part of it. Okay. I like it. We're gonna we got a lot more to talk about, but we should probably do this. Hey Bikeholics, searching for new and exciting motorcycle products? Zero 3D has the products you dream about for your bike. Check out their wide variety of innovative products for Hardy Davidson and Honda Goldwing motorcycles. Zero 3D's got your back with chrome and black parts, lighting, and other comfort products. No modifying, cutting, grinding, or welding for an easy installation. That equals less time installing and more time riding. Zero 3D has a design team of riders with over 40 years' experience with a passion for design and innovation. Zero Gold Strike are the motorcycle LED lighting innovators for CAN bus plug and play system compatibility. They pride themselves on great customer service. Got a question? Get in touch with them. Email sales at zero3d.com. Give them a call. 715-808-0027. Check out your local Harley or Honda dealership and ask for Sierra or Gold Strike parts. A new leader has emerged, so check out Zero 3D's custom line of Gold Strike products for their all-new Honda Gold Wings. Better yet, help support us. Head over to lawbindingbiker.com forward slash store. Check out our full line of Zero 3D products. Yeah, so Lurch got into it. Like a lot of us, um, not necessarily, you know, uh, for a specific reason. I mean, you didn't, you, when you were like 10, you weren't like saying, I want to be a police officer or anything no. like that. You don't remember any of that? None, none of that. It was, I, it, in high school, I started having the interest of it. And and again, it was because of seeing the patrol cars and having some interaction with state troopers. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, and uh, my story, oh, I'm technically, I, I, I am thinking about retiring, but, um, I actually remember wanting to be a fireman. Um, was a volu- it would have been smarter. It would have been smarter. Um, <laughs> I w- I'm not the brightest guy and, uh, I was a volunteer firefighter and all that kind of stuff, should've, not to get into my story, but should have stuck with that. Yeah, I know. Everybody loves a fireman. Then I was like, yeah, what's this, what's this over here? What's this shiny thing over here? You know? And, um, well, I don't want to go down the road of me, but, uh, uh, anywho. Um, so yeah, that's a good, uh, I guess good explanation of why you got into uh, that agency, so to speak, because there's a ton of agencies yeah, to I, choose from. Yeah, I, that was the one I was drawn to. Um, I, I kind of had uh, Yakima County or County Sheriff's um, Office of some kind on the back burner, uh, only because I, I like to be outdoor. I like to be somewhat free and have some autonomy. Mm-hmm. And with the patrol, you have a lot of autonomy. You got big space that you are responsible for. And uh, you can transfer around the state, which we'll talk about later as we talk about my career. And then I saw the county also is having quite a bit of that. 
um, you know, you've worked for the patrol, you've worked for a, a city agency. Um, you could probably attest that sometimes um, when you, at least my impression of it is, you know, when you work for a city agency, sometimes you're working in a much smaller area and you have a little less autonomy. So I was kind of drawn to that autonomy and that bigger area of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. I didn't. uh, And uh, I can tell you, I don't work for the Washington state patrol anymore, but I did uh, for my first 11 years. Um, And uh, I guess I never looked at it that way for, for whatever reason, but you're right. There's just a, it's a large, lot larger area that you're covering and all that. I work for a different agency now. Um, But yeah, so that's kind of brings it to how we tell tell me this. Tell me about your first couple years and where you started and and sure. how that was. Uh, I was a glorified security guard. I got hired as a trooper cadet, and that's what uh, they bring you on um, pre academy. Um, in my day, they, well, we were unarmed. Now they arm the cadets. You go through a little bit of a mini academy. They call arming. Uh, but back then, we got two weeks of training, and I got sent to the governor's mansion for security so i had the full trooper uniform on and no gun nothing mm. but my ass baton and a can of oc10 to protect the governor and a mag <laughs> and a mag flashlight a, big a old mag, fl- mag yeah. flashlight yeah. bro you know back then that's what it was yeah we we had the radio and the phone to call call the real troopers if something went down but I, that's where i started i did nine months at the governor's um mansion doing security for the governor and then i went to the academy which is in shelton washington beautiful yep Rainy Shelton, Washington. Just down from the prison, the Shelton prison. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. About a half, out, half hour outside of uh, Olympia, for those listening, give you an idea where it's at. And uh, that was about a, if I recall, about six months out there. Yeah. And then two months uh, on a coaching trip in, uh, I did my coaching trip in Bellevue. That's like a FTO. Mm-hmm. They call it a coaching trip at the state patrol, but a formal training officer, you know, right? Yeah, we call it, we call our our. our I don't know why they call it a coaching trip because they, we do refer to our trainers as FTOs. Okay. So I have no idea. And, a lot, and other agencies call it PTO. Yeah, police training officer. Mm-hmm. Did, yeah, it's it's changed over the years depending on yeah. So what I did program my, they're using. I did my two months in um, uh, in Zone Three, which uh, District Two Zone Three, which is Bellevue, basically the uh, the four hundred five corridor that go, parallels the I five corridor. And uh, from a kid, for a little you know hillbilly kid from Yakima, that was a bit of a culture shock going on uh, uh, training on on that busy road. In fact, I almost ran into somebody the first couple of days. My uh, my FTO wanted to wanted us to not get onto I ninety but stay on four hundred five, and so I had to move back over out of the two or three lanes at exit to I ninety. Mm-hmm. And as a you know good driver, I turned my head and did a head check, and in the meantime, somebody stopped in front of me, and Ooh. I just remember hearing my coach yell shit oh my god you never told me that story <laughs> yeah. locked up the brakes and missed that car by a hair holy cow yeah, yeah. you never told me that one. Oh yeah, yeah. oh and then the, 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 another funny thing is uh i was working with my fto and we were in the express lanes on uh, i-90 coming out of seattle towards bellevue and uh he was standing outside the car and he was going to wave in a, a a speeder and the guy didn't stop he kept on, on going and so my coach is throwing shit in the car but he's telling me go 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 so I start to go, go, go. Without him? <laughs> Without him. Oh, yeah. my God, like, dude. Hey, you know, he yells at me, and I stop. He gets in, we take off. I'm like, man, I was following what you told oh me Oh, my to God, do. dude. Nice. Yeah, nice. so damn near left my, my FTO stand on the side <laughs> of the road. But it's funny, you know, looking back on some of that stuff when you're brand new. Mm-hmm. It's a lot to take in. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah. lot to take in. Uh, I did a couple years in Bellevue, uh, out of the Bellevue office, uh, working I-90 and, and 405. And I figured I'd have to be over there for a while because, generally speaking, um, so you, to, when you get hired on the patrol, you right. go where they send you. And uh, back then, um, most of the troops, new troopers, went to the Tacoma area, the Seattle area, mm-hmm. the Marysville area. That's changed over the years. Uh, I think partly because of geographical pay, they pay a little bit more now for those troopers that are living in those metro, more expensive areas. Mm. Uh, but also, they've done a lot more recruiting and hiring out of those areas. So, the, um, believe it or not, it's it's the it's the areas here on the east side of the state sometimes that are where all the new guys are going. But back then it was over there and I thought I'd be there for quite a while, but I got lucky after a couple of years, my transfer request was honored and I was able to come home in July, 99. Yeah. So you spent how many years over there? Two. Two, just the two. Well, I mean, post Academy. Yeah. Two in Bellevue. Right. Right. Yeah. Post Academy. Technically it was about from day to hire. It was uh, closer to three that I was three to four that I was on the West side. And over there on 
you know, I-90 and 405 and all that, dude, you're pretty much just getting slammed, especially during the day with just collisions, right? Yeah, it's a different kind of work. It's a lot of calls for service, a lot of disabled vehicles, a lot of crashes. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't get to be as proactive until, you know, midday or later in the evening when traffic calms down. Right. And you worked all shifts over there. Yeah. Because they still change monthly, right? Uh, at the time, is every two months, we'd change shifts. And uh, it was either a day shift or a night shift. And those, you know, varied. It could start anywhere, day shift could start anywhere from five in the morning to eight in the morning, and they were ten hour shifts. And then the night shifts would start anywhere from uh, four to seven at night. All right, so uh, ripping it up over there, and uh, probably as soon as you could. I think if I remember right, it was after a year you could put in for yeah. a transfer. If I remember right, yeah. Back then they would you could put in your transfer once you had a year in. Now they'll let you put in a transfer right away, but you can't. You can only accept a transfer back to the area that you were hired from okay gotcha so gotcha. Let's, let's say i get hired out, out of yakima i go somewhere i can put my name on yakima right away and so even on probation that's right i could come back to yakima but in those days you had to be off probation before you can ask for a transfer right and like you said the east side of washington state the beautiful side um the drier side god's is, country it was yeah it was really hard to uh to get back over here i can remember that mm -hmm. and so you got transferred to yakima and i uh, I'm not going to give my full backstory, but I started in Shelton. Mm -hmm. um, not the academy's there, but there's also an office there. Um, I started out of there, and uh, then I ended up transferring over to the east side of the state. Probably a class ahead of me, wouldn't it be? Mm, yeah. 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 What class were you? Uh, 80th. Yeah, yeah, yep. And One I transferred class. July of 99. Okay. So you, did you, you must have come over in end of 98 or beginning of 99. Yeah, because, yeah, 96. Yeah, because I went to Sunnyside and then to Yakima. So, yeah. Yeah, 96, 98, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because I still remember when I was in the academy and you were assigned uh, to the Shelton detachment, we had to go out for the day and do traffic control, and they'd take you into downtown Shelton and have you control an intersection. Yeah. And I remember this uh, troop going by thinking he was really cool. He had these old-school Oakleys on and a oh, big yeah. old mustache kind of. Got the lean going on. My just porn like, stash. Yeah, it was a young Reiner lacquer. I mean, nice. I looked at that guy and I thought, boy, he thinks he's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice, dude. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's sweet. I, yeah, it's funny that you remember that, man. Uh, I do not. I remember doing tra traffic control and stuff, but because I was working there, that's why yeah, I went you by. You drove yeah. by because you were working. Because I was working there and yeah. you were in training, technically. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. You got hired before me. Uh, yeah, yes. With the cadets. Just, only a couple of weeks, but I went to the governor's mansion and you went to the to, academy. Straight to the academy. Yeah, it was a very short two weeks and then I boot, booted off to the academy. So yeah. Oh man, the good old days, buddy. Good old days. And then, so at some point, uh, I want to talk about some of your, um, you know, assignments and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, at some point we both got transferred to the Yakima yeah. office, which is where we worked out of. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, you know, I don't remember if you were there, if you got transferred up to Yakima before I got there, or if you came up, you might've been in Sunny. I think you were in Sunnyside and then came up to Yakima. So you technically, you got home or at least you got to the area before I did. Um, but you know, I, I vaguely remember we went to the same high school. Um, you were a couple classes ahead of me. So, I mean, I remember you, um, yeah, but we didn't really get to know each other until we worked together in Yakima. Mm -hmm, right. We knew who each other yeah. were. So to speak, and that, yeah. so it would have been like two thousand, I think, around there somewhere. Um, I was uh, driving what we called our aggressive driver apprehension team vehicle. It was a eight at eight at, and uh, all the to make it, put that into simple terms, it's just an unmarked car that we used to um, blend into traffic. It had uh, uh, it didn't look like a typical police car for the most part. It didn't have um, a, uh, identifiable markings or license plates. Or you know, spotlight. It was it really blended in with traffic, and uh, I was driving that vehicle, um, and the uh, a dog handler, Chris Bacchus, a friend of ours, was in another detachment, and he was trying to figure out. Him and his sergeant um, were trying to figure out how to get some type of criminal interdiction program mm -hmm. going, and so um, I worked with him. We, act, we what we did is actually take the two programs and kind of combine them. And uh, and I didn't come up with this name. I think it was uh, Kurt Hotel that came up with mm -hmm. this one. But uh, the Serious Highway Crime Apprehension Team, SCAT, SCAT, um, is what kind of came out of that. SCAT is how we call it. We call it, it SCAT. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some people call it SCAT. SCAT just to, yeah, just to give us a bad time because we right. had we had other names we tried to come up with that was much cooler. But you mm -hmm. know, 
rank has its privilege. Yeah, right, right. Uh, so I was working with uh, Chris, and then uh, and you'll have to correct me if I'm not right on this. I can't remember at what point um, you came in. It wasn't an official program. It was just it really didn't take off until you, me, and Chris were working together, and we really did it. It was kind of informal, just Chris and I. I can't remember if you came in to work with us or you got the canine. I got the canine. Canine and first, came okay. In to work with you guys, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I and I think and Chris worked with more than just me. I he must have worked with you too at some at points because you I were think pretty so. good. At dr- you're pretty good at drug interdiction back then, even before you had a dog. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's pretty much what that team was about if you guys wonder what that was it was about all serious highway crime yeah. apprehension guns drugs um whatever um any, whatever we can find whatever we can find whatever's going up and down the mm-hmm. the interstate systems or freeways or highways and all that kind of stuff so and it became a popular program you know you and and chris and i uh really put a lot into it and made a, a program that went statewide and mm-hmm. it's still active it's not quite the level it was back then but uh, it's still active and I got to be honest with you, some of the best time in my career. Yeah. It was a hoot. Me too. Me too. We had a blast. Um, we were pretty tight um, team, mm-hmm. um, worked together. We had other, a fourth position, and that would was a rotational. Yep. We had people coming in and out. But, um, yeah, we've got a lot of pictures um, of a lot of stuff that we took off, you know, loads. And significant drug significant arrests and cash seizures. Cash seizures. And guns, and- yeah. Cars, guns, yeah, um, a lot of stuff there, um, and, and some old pics that are fun to look through. I haven't looked through them in a long <laughs> yeah. time. Uh, we definitely look younger than we are. Uh, I was skinnier and led uh, less gray hair. That's for yes, sure. Yes, we, yeah, we were both. Uh, yeah, look like kids, man. Look like kids. Um, and then talk about where we took that program. We did a lot of other stuff too, like train and all that. Besides just working, kind of turn that into. Yeah, we ended up being uh, instructors um, with the program. We came, uh, we wrote a, a policy manual for the program, um, and then we also were instructors. We'd go around the state and teach uh, drug interdiction, criminal interdiction to, um, well, hell, all kinds of people, all kinds of officers. We had prosecutors and all kinds of stuff. People come to that. Come through the training, yeah. yeah. We would go around, um, and uh, yeah, different a lot, not just uh, that agency, but agencies, all kinds of agencies. from all over. and. Mm-hmm. We really just over time really developed that program, and uh, that was some of our funnest stories and just fun times of traveling together and teaching together and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, the old scat days. Yeah, so good. That's uh, good to reflect back up on. And uh, I don't remember how many years we did that before we um, kind of moved on. And well, I promoted out of it and I promoted in 2010. Yep. And, and I changed agencies. Yes. Right. Around there. Yeah. 2006. Six earlier than that. That's right. Yeah. 2006. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it kept going. It's like I said, it's still in existence. Um, but I promoted out. I took a promotion to sergeant for some reason. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would have, yeah, ended up in Seattle too from Yakima because I think I forget it was like number 15 or something. Yeah. When I, yeah, switch, dude. Um, yeah, I would have been over on the slab. I'm kind of glad I missed that part. But I think things work out for a reason. Yep. Kept yep. you home. Exactly. All right, let's do this real quick. Are you searching for the easiest and quickest detachable luggage system for your motorcycle? Rick Rack has just what you're looking for. Forget all those frustrating straps and bungee cords that can come loose and slap your paint. Slap your paint. Check out one of Rick Rack's awesome quick attached strapless luggage rack systems. This father-son team designed something really special you can't find it anywhere else. Yep, and these guys ride, so they truly understand the needs of bikers. The Rick Rack Quick Attack system is strong, durable, and secure with a lockable system. Also, check out their full line of quality touring bikes to accompany your quick detached system. Once you use Rick Rack, you'll never go back. What are you waiting for, bikeaholics? Head over to Law Abiding Biker Store and check out our full line of Rick Rack systems and bags. There you go. Mm-hmm. Lurch, what else you got for us? I know, I know you got other stuff here. Ah, yeah. So tell us about um, some of the other. Was it? Were you? Yeah, actually, you were a collision tech while you were in yeah. SCAT because you had to get called for that, right? And explain actually, what that is a little bit. And- so a collision technical specialist, you just get a little bit more training in collision investigation, so that you can do speed workups and you know damage analysis and. Um, 
what we call occupant kinematics, knowing where people were in the car and how they moved. And you'd basically just not to a, there's also a reconstructionist. So I don't want to confuse that with uh, right recon with, but you all, you do help reconstruct the collision and make sense of it. And, um, I really became a, a, a tech cause nobody else wanted to do it in the detachment. <laughs> I, I tried to get out of it, but, uh, I enjoyed doing it. I liked the part of going out to the scene and, um, photographing measuring and figuring out what happened i didn't like the amount of time it took to write the reports yeah and we were running hot and heavy uh with the scat team back then and uh i was one of two collision techs in the yakima valley and there was uh, the the couple years that i did do that um i averaged 20 to 22 cases a a year yeah that's a lot man yeah and i remember um one december the other techs off on vacation i got five in one month and uh it just while i enjoyed it it's hard to do uh, multiple special tease and do well at them to give it a hundred percent. And my heart was in the the scat team, the criminal interdiction. And so uh, after a couple of years of that, of being a tech, I went in and talked to my sergeant and told him I didn't want to do it anymore. And, and luck, thankfully he, he was, he backed me up and I was able to get out of it because quite often once uh, somebody's invested, at least the, with the patrol, once they invest that in you, they don't really don't want you to back out of right. the training and, and the responsibility. So I was lucky that had good command staff that allowed me to back out of that and focus on, on the interdiction. Yep. Yep. And, uh, with, and talking about that, you know, he got out of the, or he was still in the SCAT team, um, as he was a collision technical specialist. Um, you also did some other stuff. Talk about that. Yeah. As a firearms and uh, defensive tactics instructor as well. So, um, I would teach, uh, the marksmanship and do run the qualifications for the, the, the troopers and also, uh, teach the, quarterly defensive tactics and all the the refreshers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You had a lot on your plate. Like I did at times mm-hmm. in your career, just a yeah. lot of stuff on the plate doing. And it, on this, I just want to back up just a little bit on the scat team guys. Um, that was obviously, uh, you know, troopers. And then we had canines. I was one of the canine handlers right. um, assigned to that team. Dr- they were drug detection canines. And now um, the state patrol also has bomb detection. Yes. Um, dogs back then they were getting started with the bomb detection dogs. I remember because we would go to training and they would get do some of the bomb detection. Now it's fairly large program because they do the ferries right yep. and all that. Yeah, we got the they do the security for all the ferry systems and whatnot. And so that I think the well, I do know that the bomb detection dog uh, cadre is bigger than the drug detection. Yeah, and there's been a lot of changes in drug laws um, in Washington over the years. Yeah, I mean you can. I mean, in Seattle, I, they don't even prosecute you for cocaine and heroin. So, right. um, you know, back when we got started, um, the drug laws were a lot stiffer. Yeah, if you had a half-burnt roach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know? even if we had to, you know, shake your uh, floor mat out, we, we'll find right. some. Right, right, yeah. I'm just yeah. kidding, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. they, there, there was, small, you know, small possession was still a big deal, mm-hmm. you know, 20 years ago now. It's it's not. So yep. there's a lot of focus on on homeland security, and there's also a lot of funds that come from that too. So there's a lot more of a focus on the the bomb and gun detection versus the drug detection right now. Right, right, yeah, yeah. But I was one of the non canine handlers, so we had canine uh, handlers, and then we had partners, and so I was one of the ones that didn't have a dog. Although I wanted your dog, it just yes. I didn't have. I didn't, when when the time came up and we could apply for it, I didn't have the required four years. Of, uh, of, of non-probationary time. Commission time. It was like three and a half years. Uh, so I was, I was unable to put in for it. That's right. I yeah. do remember that. Uh-huh. I do remember so that. So I, I, didn't, I didn't hold a grudge, but maybe a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a yeah, little bit. Right. I get it. But it I worked out it. because um, being a non-canine uh, member of the SCAT team, I got to have all the benefits and the fun, but I didn't have all the responsibility of True. the dog. True. True. Because it is a lot. Oh, yeah. You take, them, you take the of, dog home. They uh, live with you. You got to take care of them. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot of responsibility. Train them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Train them, feed them vacations, figure out what you're doing on vacations and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, big responsibility, but yeah, I do remember that you were just shy of, of that, uh, being able to do that. Not sorry. that I would have got it. Anyways, sorry about that. Would have been nice to have a shot. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> not, sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 Um, so we talked a little bit about promoting to Sergeant you, uh, now this is the interesting part of Lurch's, um, uh, careers moved around a lot, um, yeah. where I guess I didn't, uh, initially I just came East. I went from the West side to the East side. I mean, I moved, you know, sunny side to Yakima, but small moves. I'm not spending time away. So talk about your Sergeant spot a little bit when you promoted out and where you went and what you did. 
One of the benefits of working for a state agency is that you can transfer and promote all over the state. Uh, one of the downsides is if you want to promote, you're going to have to move around the state, generally speaking. Uh, one of the benefits of being in eastern Washington is is the um, it's the culture, but there's it's also less populous. You got a little more room to grow, you know, um, and it's um, it's it's uh, desirable, and so it's hard to get back to some of these positions. You know, as a trooper, there's you know at one time 24 spots in Yakima, but there was three sergeants. So as you move up your chances of getting back home get smaller and smaller. And some people are lucky, you know, a spot will open up and they'll get, they'll stay right home. Um, but I, I was not quite that lucky. Uh, my promotion to sergeant was, um, well, I, let me take, let me walk you down a little bit. I, I, the first test I took, I just took it on a whim and uh, they got down to me and I had a chance to, to promote to sergeant. Um, and it was the last p- uh, promotion on that list. And it was a motorcycle sergeant position Mm. Marysville. Bring it to motorcycles. Bring it to yeah. motorcycles. So if anybody was wondering if we're going to talk about motorcycles, here we are. Mm-hmm. Um, so my, my, I was, I did the interview. I was selected as the motorcycle sergeant. Um, but, uh, because it was the last, um, position or last promotion on that list, they sent an alternate through as well. And they told me ahead of time. I mean, I knew what I was getting into. And, um, uh, John Hunter was his name, but the two of us went through, motorcycle school if i successfully made it through school then i was going to get promoted and get the position uh if not and he was successful then he would have got the slot and i never had any formal motorcycle training up until that point uh, but i had been riding bikes since i was 18 so i had several years of bad habits mm-hmm. uh, and uh, they're really you know those bad habits are hard to get rid of um as an as your, yourself as an instructor would probably agree with this but i have heard it said that it's easier to teach somebody that's never rode a motorcycle before uh, to get through uh, police school than it is somebody that's got some experience. Commonly, and both of us being firearms instructors, same. That too, that's that, right. That can also... Because they do exactly what you teach them and you tell them and they don't have bad habits. They get get it right, yeah. the foundation from the... Yeah, foundation up, yeah. So my first few days of um, class um, of the motorcycle school was trying to really undo a lot of those bad habits. And... Um, I have a whole new respect for motors officers. It is hard work. It's physically demanding. It's mentally demanding. It's tough. Um, and I was really struggling. And then at one point, it just kind of clicked. I remember we did a drill, and I'm not sure what you guys call it. I can't remember if they call it the WSP circle or it's a clover leaf. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're basically intersection, probably. It, yeah, clover you, leaf. Yeah, it's a clover leaf. It's four, four. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's a big. It's a big square uh, with cones. Four like cones, a cross. Like a cross, yeah. and you've got a lock turn to the right. Lock turn. All you're doing is lock turning. Left, yep. right, left, right, left, right, and you're going in a... Uh, it's an intersection. Okay, yeah, and you're going in a uh, uh, a, a cloverleaf pattern. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would line up, everybody get in line and get into that thing, and you're right on the bike in front of you, and you just keep going until you're the hopefully the last one in there. And uh, I was I, I, that's when I really understood the gray area. It finally came to me, and the gray mm-hmm. area, for those that you don't know, is that... F- that sweet spot in the friction zone where you you're engaging, you're able to move, but you're not going too fast. You're not burning up the clutch. It's really you're re- dragging the clutch. You're what dragging you're, it, yeah, yeah. and uh, you're going really slow. Mm-hmm. And it just clicked, and I was last one uh, standing in that one, and I got so much confidence back after that. Mm-hmm. And the next couple of days, I was doing really well. Um, just a funny story. I remember, um, doing some of the on-road, off-road stuff. And, uh, every morning when we'd take off in the morning to do our training, it was follow the leader. You'd follow the instructor. Yep. Yep. They're driving off curbs and up yep. gravel roads. Uh, on the back side of the Washington State Patrol Academy's driving course, there is a really steep hill. And, uh, anybody that knows, uh, Shelton, Washington knows it rains. And so I'm over there in <laughs> a April. lot. I'm over there in April, uh, doing this course and our lead instructor, um, stops right at the bottom of that hill, goes through a mud water-filled ditch, and then goes right up that, that hillside. Uh-huh. And it was steep. And uh, these were uh, BMWs at the time that uh, uh, were road bikes. They didn't have knobby tires or anything like that on it. And, uh, you know, the first first student didn't even make it through the ditch because it was full of water. He just <laughs> made it halfway through and crashed. And I'm about sixth or seventh in line. I'm watching these guys either not make it through the ditch, go a couple feet, you know, a couple uh, yards up the hill and crash. And I, I'm going up there, and I am probably ten feet from the top of the hill, and I could feel the smile on my face. Yeah, and then thinking you're going to make it, thinking I'm going to make it, and then my back tire started to slip a little bit, 
and not being a dirt bike rider, um, I didn't know just to pull the clutch in a little bit. Don't mess mm-hmm. with the throttle. Just pull your clutch in a little bit so that your wheel stops spinning, mm-hmm. and you'll get right up. I did what you shouldn't do, and I gave it more gas. So mm-hmm. the, the back tire slid out, went out from underneath me, and I was 10 feet from the top of the hill. Uh. But the two guys that made it were dirt bike riders, and they shared that with me. They came out. When you're getting towards the top, if, you, if it starts slipping, don't change your throttle position. Don't give it more. Just grab the clutch and yep. squeeze in a little bit, and it'll it'll go right up. And so the second time we did it, it went right up. Yep. But what uh, slow I, that rear tire down a little bit? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was it was good information. Uh, so towards the end of the first week, um, there's a drill where you're coming through a chicane, and then you come to a complete stop, and you have to do a 180 out of the drill. So you lock. You have to. I think if I remember right, it's like a 90 degree turn to the left. You straighten it up, and then you have to do a, mm-hmm. a lock turn and do 180 degrees and come out the other end. And I'd already did it successfully once, but the second time I wasn't set up quite right. So when I lock turned to do the 180 out of the drill, I ran, I ran over the base of a cone, mm. and the cone went flying. With your front tire? My front tire. And it'll wash you? It did wash me. Oh, yeah. Faster than you can imagine. I One minute I'm up, the next minute I'm down. So I didn't have any time to really brace myself, and I pounded my right hip and my shoulder and my head into the pavement. Yeah. And uh, I picked my bike up like I'm supposed to do, and I get on it, and I go back and get in line again and trying to stretch everything out. And um, I really screwed up my hip i thought maybe Mm. i I thought i maybe broke something yeah and uh at lunchtime one of the instructors came up to me and he says uh matt when you don't think anybody's watching you're limping around pretty good um i just want you to think about it we're picking up the speed after lunch and if you're not able to lean and turn like do things you're supposed to do you're going to get hurt Mm -hmm. and uh i I, it was it was very humbling um, because that at uh, that point in my career, I had achieved a lot of things, as we talked about already, um, not used to failure. Mm-hmm. And um, they weren't, I mean, he's not telling me we're washing you out. He's just saying you're hurt and you could really hurt yourself bad. And I had to think about it um, because it was for a promotion. Riding bikes with patrol wasn't really necessarily one of my dreams, especially going over on the I-5 and working in the rain on a bike. Mm-hmm. Um, and it had a two-year commitment. Um, the position. So if I was, if I made it through the training and was a sergeant, it's two year commitment over Marysville. And I just had to really examine myself and, and realize that maybe I'm not in it for the right reason. So right. I, I, after that, it took me all lunch, but I did go in and talk to him and I said, I, I think I need to, to, yeah, to leave. I'm, I, am, I am hurting. Yeah. So I mean, I remember putting my gun, but my uniform back on and my gun belt back on to drive home and I had to take my gun belt off because my hip was hurting. Oh boy. It took me a couple of weeks to kind of shake it off, but uh, I have a whole new respect for it. That's a, it, it's not, it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's very grueling. I appreciate yeah. you st- sharing that story yeah. though, openly and honestly, because yeah, that's not an easy thing No, to, you know, something you want to do and uh-huh. yeah, and that, yeah. So I'm just glad you didn't break anything. Or, yeah, me you too. Because you get a permanent injury right. too, you know. And, and there's people that get pretty mm-hmm. banged up and break stuff doing those those schools. But yeah. anyways, that was a long, long-winded thing. But it was more cycle, no, I'm more cycle related, about- so I wanted to definitely talk about it. Uh, so I, I took the the next test. The next and sergeant's next test. Next sergeant's exam. Every two years they take one. So you couldn't stay on the sergeant's list. It was No, because it expired. It, it, expired. it gotcha. was It was the last one. And so um, I had to... Uh, study pretty quick for the next one that was coming up. I took it, but unfortunately, they um, I, I scored well, um, but there just wasn't a lot of promotions that year. And, and a lot of that's based on retirement, right? Mm-hmm. It depends on how many people retire and open up positions, and so there just wasn't enough. And then on my third one, I got promoted, and I went to a little town called Nacelle, Washington. Mm-hmm. I, 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 told my, I talked about it with my wife. She says, well, I don't, wherever they offer it, just take it, and we'll figure it out. And uh, when... Uh, when human resources called me and said that a promotion was available to NACEL, I said, I'll take it. And, uh, and then I had to get a map out and find out where the right, hell no NACEL doubt, was. No doubt. So it's, uh, it's in the bottom Southwest corner out on the, it's a, it's near long beach, uh, Washington, Washington yep. mm-hmm. just, just North of seaside, Oregon. So it's way, it's about five hours away. It's quite a haul. Um, it really neat little beat, um, one detachment beat. I thought I'd be there for a while. Cause, uh, looking at, um, who the sergeants were here in Yakima, which is where I wanted to get to be. Um, none of them, I didn't think we were going to go anywhere anytime soon. Uh, but I got lucky. Um, uh, one of the s- sergeants, actually the sergeant that vacated the nacelle spot came to Yakima. Um, and something I just hadn't thought of is uh, one of the sergeants down in uh, Tri-Cities got promoted to lieutenant. 
And uh, and the the one that I'd followed out to Nacelle, she took a transfer down to Tri uh, Tri Cities, and I got Yakima in two months. So I was really lucky there. I got back to yep. Yakima in two months. Yeah, that is that is crazy lucky, no doubt. Well, we still got a lot more, but uh, we should uh, thank Butt Buffer. We should thank one of our sponsors. Do you want to do it? Ride longer and treat your ass with some respect already. Get hooked up with a premium butt buffer seat cushion. This company of bikers developed a super thin hospital grade seat cushion made of solid and elastic materials. And it's unlike gel pads that will leak if punctured. The butt buffer is designed not to slide around on your seat, fits all motorcycles, installs in seconds, cleans easily, and yep, helps dampen vibrations. With plenty of miles to choose from, they assure you'll have a comfortable ass when riding. Head on over to the Law Abiding Biker store and check out our full line. A butt buffer seat cushions. There you go. All right. And so, yeah, I was pretty lucky getting back that quick to hometown, which is where you wanted to be mm -hmm. and uh, where you could have stayed. Could have stayed. As a sergeant. Yeah. Um, I, I was pretty lucky here, though. I, I, I um, was, uh, they had uh, a program that was uh, statewide called the Target Zero Team. It's essentially a DOI squad. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, it was federally funded. And so they would, the, with the funds, it would fund a detachment of six and a new sergeant uh, for, I think it was two years. And then the patrol had to absorb the cost afterwards. But that, that I had a lot of fun on, on, on that TZT team because I was, I didn't want to do it because I had a line detachment. And I really liked my detachment. I got to work days and nights and, and the TZT team primarily worked nights, but I had a lieutenant and a captain that told me that they needed me to do it and mm -hmm. con convinced me, Vaughn told me to do it. Right, um, and, uh -huh. and, and it worked out in the long run. I had to recruit for that detachment. So I, I went around the, the, the district recruiting people and we put a hell of a team together and had a lot of fun. Um, primarily worked the, the lower valley, Yakima Valley, because uh, that's where our, most of our fatality collisions were happening at the time. And... Uh, I think uh, if I remember right, we had 84 vehicle pursuits in the two years yeah, as wow. a sergeant. So just crazy times. We had a lot of fun. And, and I really, when I got back to Yakima as a sergeant, I really thought I had made it. You know, I'm yeah. like, this is where I'm, I'm going to finish out. I'm going to stay in Yakima. And, you know, obviously with uh, the increased uh, responsibility comes pay. Yep. So now I'm making a little bit more money. Uh, my retirement is going to be higher. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to retire in Yakima as a sergeant. Yep. And I, I'm glad you brought that back because I skipped that. I skipped the, the Eberg time, right? No, no time in Eberg. It, why did I think you spent time? No. I don't know. No, you didn't. Okay. No, no. Just, no. It uh, was just the, and Yakima. And Yakima, TZT. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I don't know why I thought that, that you spent a short stint there, but thinking of somebody else. I, ne I never thought I'd be a sergeant, um, but you know, you get, you get enough time on and uh, you have some good sergeants. You have some bad sergeants. Yep. And what did it for me was the challenge. Um, I was ready for a new challenge, but also I saw some sergeants that I wasn't terribly um, uh, fond of. And, and I thought that I would be a good sergeant. And I, and I thought that the, you know, my coworkers deserved better than some yeah. of the, the other sergeants I had seen in the past. So I just, I thought that I, I, I was ready for the new challenge, but I also thought that I could provide um, a good leadership that the other troopers deserved. Yeah. Yeah, I think you did too. Yeah, I did. Even all though right. I wasn't there, but I think I you did. did. All right. I really, yeah. From what I'm told, I yeah, did, I did okay. Yeah, yeah. And like you say, and like we've said a couple times, and you could have stayed in I hometown, could've. which is where his home is, and his wife. And um, I will just say, Lurch doesn't have any kids. No, which so makes it a little bit easier to move around. A little bit of mm -hmm. what, yeah, what we're gonna finish, or, or I guess we got a few things to, to talk about yet. But at some point, you decided sergeant wasn't good enough. No, I didn't actually. I, I was quite happy where I was. Right. Um, that, but, but the same two, the same lieutenant and captain told me that I needed to take the lieutenant's test. And one of the they things they volunteered you again. They, well, they didn't volunteer me on there. Uh, having been uh, having retired at the position I did, that I understand that now others will see. It's sometimes hard for you to see in yourself, but others will see things in you and think that maybe you would be you do well at the next advanced position. Mm -hmm. And so I had my lieutenant, my captain come to me. And in fact, I still remember what my captain told me at the time. He said, you know, the patrol's given you a lot. It's time for you to give back. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're kidding. Oh, you're that killing one me stuck. with that one. That, one's, yeah. that was good, huh? Yeah, it is That good. one really stuck. And so I took the lieutenant's exam. It's similar to the uh, sergeant's exam, except it's a little heavier on the administrative and the writing part of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, my heart wasn't in it. It really wasn't. I didn't study that hard for that one. Um, yeah. And, and those lists are small. So the, the sergeant's lists are top 70 people plus ties will be on there. But generally speaking, you know, it averages probably gets into the, they promote down into the 30s, generally speaking. Some years it's 20, some years it's down in the 40s. So an average somewhere in the 30s. Mm-hmm. When it comes to, those, comes to the lieutenant's test. And obviously the farther you go up in, in a, a agency, there's less positions available. Uh, but the lieutenant's list is the top 30. And I came out 18 on out of 30. I thought, whew. Okay. You're good. I, I wasn't last. I gave right. it a good go. Nobody would hold it against right in me. The middle. Nobody would hold it against me, but I'm safe. Because, you know, for a long time, they were only promoting about 10 off of those yeah. lieutenants lists. But it was a it was a two-year cycle where a lot of people retired. A lot of lieutenants and captains retired, and they went down below 18. I think they went to the 22 or 23 that year and uh, found my dumb ass getting promoted to lieutenant. Uh-huh, yep. And, uh, and uh, I did an interview for a couple of positions, and the one I ended up getting was uh, with our motor carrier safety division, which is commercial vehicle stuff, and it was based out of Olympia. So I moved again. I moved to Olympia. Moved again. Now, he moved. You heard that. He moved. I moved. He did, his wife stayed here, mm-hmm. and so they still have the same home um, as when he first became yeah. a troop. Uh, and so, yeah, so you decided that uh, you were going to, yeah, move. There you go. Yeah. You did. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I got lucky again. The uh, the the division I was in um, only had one lieutenant's position, and it had four commercial vehicle officer fours. And uh, the the fours are the, the the top rank for the commercial vehicle officers. And uh, when they divided up the the larger division and made the commercial vehicle division the motor carrier safety division, commercial vehicle division got three lieutenants and no fours, and then motor carrier got four of the CVO fours and one lieutenant. Mm-hmm. And we found over time that we really needed an east side lieutenant position. And so my captain at the time says, "I finally got that position." And they they'd been trying to get one for several years mm. he says i finally got it approved matt if i put it in yakima would you be interested in that position was this after the case of whiskey you gave <laughs> yeah. him left on his desk right <laughs> yeah uh, uh good good guy great great captain and uh there and there, there, there was room and a, and a business need to put it in yakima but i still had to interview for it yeah right i mean the way the process works you know the way the the i don't know the um, collective bargaining agreement is for the lieutenants and captains association i had to interview for it so I did another interview for the same job I already had, but you know, it, I guess he could not select me if he wanted to, but it kept everything on the up and up. And so I interviewed for that position and was selected and got to go home for about a year and a half. Yeah. And now. Lucky move. Now I thought, now I've really made it. Now I'm home and I'm, I'm home. a lieutenant. I'm a lieutenant. Um, no, I, I don't work the road. Right. Um, I was in a division where all of my um, direct reports were commercial vehicle enforcement officers. So there's a lot less worry because um, generally speaking, not as high liability. There you go. Thank you. Um, you know they're not in the pursuits. They're not taking people to jail, arresting drunks, getting in fights, and doing all that stuff that's inherently dangerous in law enforcement. Uh, they're doing more DOT for most folks out there. It's more like DOT regulations when it comes to trucks. So right, uh, I, it was a really good position. It was it was a nine to five Monday through Friday. Phone didn't ring much after five o'clock. Very cush gig and fun. It was something different. Mm-hmm. You know, as troopers, they don't really teach us a whole lot about trucks. When they, I mean, as far as the really nitty gritty stuff when it comes to truck loss, because we have people that do that. We have the commercial vehicle officers, so yep. it was fun. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm home. I've got about three, four years left in my career. If I retire at twenty five years, um, I'm a lieutenant now, and I'm home. I've made it. Yep. Uh huh. So we thought. <laughs> so I so thought. we thought. Yeah. And uh, apparently that wasn't good enough because uh, he got asked again or voluntold. No, well, this, it, this it, wasn't. So yeah, this is no. So I got promoted to captain for the last three years of my career as a captain. But in, in, in the state patrol, the Washington State Patrol, anyways, uh, those are appointed positions. Your last RCW rank, the last rank you test for is lieutenant. Anything above and beyond that is all appointed and at will. So essentially, I was on permanent probation. But you still go on a, you still interview for it and stuff like that. No, you didn't at all. Okay, I forgot. No. So I mean, it's it's the chief's leisure. I mean, he or, just, or okay. not leisure is is prerogative. Um, you didn't have to sit down and talk with him. Nope. Oh wow. Okay. Yes and no. All I mean, right. he, so I thought you did, but I yeah. 
this chief in particular really keeps a, his his uh, pulse on on the lieutenants and what's going on, and he knows he's got a short list, and it doesn't mean that. There's no rank. There's no like one, two, three, right. four, five. I mean, but there might be a pool of three or four or five people that he's really got his eye on. And depending on the job and a, depending on your skills and abilities, he's going to put you in that position. He's really good at getting the right person in the right job. Mm-hmm. So it just really just depends on what opens up and what kind of, you know, what, what you bring to the table. Um, and and the, he can interview people. He has before when there's been a lot of, movement a lot of uh, retirements a lot of promotions he's not 100 percent sure and he needs just a one more go to kind of talk to everybody but in my case there was no interview no other no nothing in fact i was in yakima at my desk and the field operations bureau lieutenant and captain which are the ones that oversee the troopers mm-hmm. uh, they were over uh, in olympia actually um, doing our their quarterly report to the chief and so i'm the only command level person there as a lieutenant and the phone rang, and my initial it was right. I could see on the caller ID that it was our communication center. And I thought, oh crap, something's mm-hmm. happened now. I got, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to go handle it because these guys are uh, out of town. So that I, that's what I was thinking when I picked up the phone. But the dispatcher she says, "Hey, uh, Chief Batiste is on the line. He wants to talk to you." Really? Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. Uh, one of two things. I, this might be a good call, or maybe I screwed something yeah. up. Right. And I, I still remember my my hands, and my feet getting a little bit sweaty. And when uh, when I picked up the phone, I actually stood up and, and more or less stood at attention, you know, like, hey, yeah. chief. And he, he just said, hey, Matt, I'd like you to be my motor carrier safety division captain. Would you do that for me? And then and he's then he's really good at doing that. He doesn't tell you what to do. He just, can you do that for me? Yeah, right, right. And uh, uh, I kind of knew it was coming, you know, um, because my captain and my assistant chief have been talking. Yeah, they right. talked to you about it. Hey, would you be interested you know, they're always doing a little bit of sniff, feeling, sniff, around. feeling around for the chief. So when he asks his, when the chief asks his assistant chief, hey, I'm thinking about Matt, do you think he would do it? Because generally speaking, when the, the big guy calls you, you don't tell him no. Right. He does, right. they do their research ahead of time and know that you're interested. Right. And so he um, called me and asked me to do it. So it was, I was a lieutenant in motor carrier safety. So I was staying in the same division, uh, but I was promoted to captain and had to move back to Olympia. Mm hmm. On back over the hill. And again, just he. Yeah, yes. My wife uh, stayed here. Stayed here. And uh, he, uh, yeah, rented a place over there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The first time I was over there, I rented a little uh, apartment, which was fine. Um, but this time I thought this is where I'll end up my, uh, end my career. You know, I've got three years, years left. So I rented a little house. You, you remember the house mm-hmm. you came yep. to it. Yep. So I found a little small house in Olympia to rent. Something to be a little more comfortable, a little, a little more space because I figured I'd be locked in there for yeah three years but that was not the case yeah and so away from home again and and uh it doesn't end there no yeah so you spent so i i really i was was there for a year as the motor carrier safety captain almost a year um just a little short of it actually because i had to pay rent on two places for a month and a half um but um doesn't end there yeah so i was down there you move again i move again so i again i I thought i was going to stay there but um i had a meeting uh, with some of our DOT partners, and I walked down, and on my computer, there's a note from the, the division secretary that says, Chief Batiste wants to talk to you. And uh, it took me all the way back to being a trooper, working the road. When yeah. you get hear communication say, Sergeant so-and-so would want, wants to talk to you, yeah, come right. to the office, you know, yep. you, you immediately think, it's natural. Can you tell me why? First, what did yeah. I do wrong, right? That's yeah. your natural reaction. I must have done something wrong. And so I'm thinking about, um, we had a, graduation for commercial vehicle officers are new ones and i thought did i not send him to me did i do something wrong there that maybe i did did something that wasn't uh um routine or something i'm like did, did i screw that up somehow mm-hmm. and i so i get in the elevator and i'm going he's up on the fourth floor of course i'm down in, in the basement go up to the chief's office and i i stick my head in there and look at his uh, executive um, assistant and she's got a smile on her face i'm like okay and uh, she says, yeah, he's ready for you. And I walk in, and he says, hey, man, how you doing? Come in and sit down. I'm like, okay, I'm not in trouble. Yeah, right. But what the hell is going on here? Um, because there was um, there was a couple of retirements, and there was some movement going on. Did and you they, have any idea of this? No, okay. no, no. So there was there was uh, two or three retirements, some movement, and so we knew there hadn't been a shakeup in captains for a while. And and generally speaking, he likes to move his commanders around, especially in – and if you hear me say captain and commander, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Um, so he he moves his, his uh, commanders around to get them experience in the different uh, 
the fields, you know, the different divisions and whatnot. Uh, so when it comes time for him to look for an assistant chief, he's got a, a wider pool. Mm-hmm. So my my uh, peer captain in commercial vehicle division was Tom Foster, and Tom and I were sitting there in his office trying to figure out where everybody's going to go, and we pretty much had it figured out. Uh, I told him, I said, he's going to move you, man. You've been in this position for three years. He'll move you somewhere, and I've only been here a year. I'm good. I was completely wrong. Yeah, you're just completely out. <laughs> completely wrong. So uh, anyways, we go up to, I go up to his office, and he says, how would you like to have a, a district? And uh, the, the districts are um, in field operations bureau, so they'd be it's the troopers, right? Mm-hmm, right. And those are – those are held as the coveted positions in the, in the state patrol when it comes to captain's positions is the eight district captains. And, uh, so immediately I'm thinking, I, in fact, I asked him which one chief, I thought maybe I was going to come home to Yakima. Mm-hmm. Um, cause he, he, he had a assistant chief's position open and I was really hoping that he would promote the captain out of Yakima to Olympia. Maybe I could go to Yakima, but it was Wenatchee. Yeah. And, uh, um, I said, absolutely. When you want me to start, um, I, I really that I, quick, huh? That quick. That's a, that's yeah. He goes, uh, well, um, I'm promoting Rob, and he's going to be out of there in July. So anytime after that, wow. <laughs> okay, all right, boss. And uh, I really could have finished my career in motor carrier. Love those guys. Still friends with some of them. In fact, uh, one of them, Kevin. You've heard me say mm-hmm. his name quite a bit, Kevin Valentine. Um, I've got my '53 GMC over at his house uh, in in Chehalis, and I go over there quite a bit and work on it. And, He's a Harley guy too. Yeah. He's got a road glide. Um, so I made a lot of friends and I, I was a little emotional. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised myself when I went down to tell those guys, I got a little choked up telling yeah. them I was leaving. Yeah. yeah. Um, felt bad, you know, mm-hmm. um, felt like I was letting them down, leaving and leaving them hanging, but it was a good opportunity for me. Um, got me a little closer to home, yeah. um, back into field operations. Um, you know, in fact, he, I, when I said, when I, when he asked me, I said, uh, I'm happy to do it um, if you if that's where you need me. He says that's where I need you, man. I go all right, then I'll go because he he said uh, I want to get you a little closer to your bride. Uh yeah. And I, said, and I said that doesn't have to be the only reason. I I knew what I was doing when I took this position, and I'm happy to stay here. But that's where you need me. That's where I'll go. And he said that's where I need you. Mm-hmm. So I went up to Wenatchee and finished out my career up there in the field operations bureau with the all the the troopers up there. Um, a couple of got to you know occasionally hang out with our uh, swarm few brothers up there in Wenatchee. Mm-hmm. We got a chapter up there, so neat area, a lot of fun. Um, it's been it's been a good career. Yeah, how many years were you in Wenatchee again? I was in Wenatchee for two years. Two, that's what I thought. Yeah. Two, yeah. yeah. And came back home and stayed home. And now I'm home and I'm staying home. Yeah, yeah not planning on going anywhere now. No, we kind of we kind of talked about that at the beginning of the podcast, but yeah, yep. working for you full time and yep, living home. Yep. So let me ask you, how did you just in general, um, how did it change like over the years from, you know, law enforcement from what I think we talked about a little bit about, you know, the laws, cocaine and heroin being legal now. The laws have just changed. Um, It's gotten a lot more technical. I mean, when I started, uh, we had ticket books and pens, you know, and uh, we had paper accident reports. Everything was paper and pen. Um, You know, we measured scenes with, measuring tapes and roll of tapes yep. roll of tapes you know one of those things with the wheel you just roll it along and it clicks off and tells you how many inches or feet something is and yep you know it was very rudimentary and now um you know using drones to do video photography and all kinds of stuff it's just really advanced uh, computers and all the cars but i think for me the biggest thing uh was just laws um yeah uh, uh it's a we're a pretty liberal state and I'm not a terribly liberal person. I'm pretty conservative. And so we've, it's, it's right now in the state of Washington is really pegged to the left. Uh, mm-hmm. I know in time it'll come back to the middle. Uh, people get tired of this, you know, left without getting too political. They'll get tired right. of this leftist crap and uh, we'll come back a little bit more to the middle. Um, but I was just, you know, you get tired. It's a long career after 25 years and it, it, it just, it got to the point where I wasn't as far as the, political part of it and what, how we had to operate, I was kind of losing my enthusiasm for it. And I think that's natural. You know, I remember talking to old guys when we were young troops and they're like, Oh, the good old days, man, it sucks yep. today. And yep. I think that everybody goes through that. I, even these young officers are getting hired today in this political climate in 25 years, they're going to probably be saying the same thing. I think it's just natural. People, yeah. people always told me, you'll know it, you'll know when it's time. So yeah, just, it just seems like the, 
it, we went from less of being um, uh, proactive and, and preventing crime and uh, to just responding to crime. Mm-hmm. And I didn't necessarily get into it to just respond to crime and take reports. You know, I wanted to better my community and be proactive. And right. Um, so for me, I think that's the biggest way it's changed over the years. It's just gone from uh, very proactive to very reactive. And and law enforcement just can't uh, do as much um, proactively and effectively anymore. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, it's definitely changed, but I think it's changed more over our career than maybe they say that too, yeah, or maybe. it seems like it's it seems changed like it's more changed yeah. drastically, you know, over the time. Yeah. So you just knew basically it was just a gut feeling that it was time. Uh, and- yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So ultimately why did I retire? Um, it was time, you know, I had my time and I could have stuck around for another five years. Uh, if I was home here in Yakima, I might've, mm-hmm, right. Uh, you know, I might've, cause you know, with with Rick running the store and, and you up here, you guys got a little time, and so I thought maybe I'll just keep, maybe I'll just keep working until they're ready to go. We all go together. But I was up in Wenatchee. I'd been living apart from my wife for the better part of five years. Mm-hmm. Um, the, a bunch of new laws were coming out that uh, went through the through uh, leg, the legislation uh, earlier in in the year, and it was about to come to fruition. July mm-hmm. July a lot of stuff was going last July. A lot of that was going into effect, and I just. I was ready to be home and, uh, you know, I was just losing my, I, I loved the people I work with. They, mm-hmm. you hear this saying, and I'll say it's true. You know, you never miss the circus, but you miss the clowns. Yeah. Right. Right. So yeah. I definitely miss the people and the camaraderie, but it was just time. It was somebody else's turn to, yep. to step up and take that position. And, um, you know, at a certain point, if you feel you're starting to lose your desire to do it, you know, I didn't want to be stagnant. I didn't want to, right. I didn't want to have people going that one's that old, yeah, he's just taking up leave. space. He's just taking up space. And so, you know, I went out. I think I went out at a good time for, for me and for, for my district and the agency. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. And uh, I guess I'd ask you, would you, at this at this current year, would you recommend L- law enforcement as a career to somebody? Uh, Honestly speaking, if some young kid came up. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yes and no. And I'll, I'll talk to a little bit of both of those. Uh, yes, because there's very few jobs that you can – do that you can truly say that you make a difference, a measurable difference in your, in your community. I mean, you're, you're out there potentially saving lives every day. Now there are other jobs that, that, that do that. I mean, you, you mentioned firefighters earlier, um, nurses, doctors, I, there's, there's a, those, some of those careers, but I just, I remember, in fact, I remember when I was applying and they, at the end of my, my uh, interview, they said, anything else you want to add? And I said, yeah, I just, I plan on making a career out of the Washington state patrol and I want to do a job where I know I'll make a difference in my community. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I got a lot of satisfaction from helping others and doing a job that I know that, that was bettering my community. Now with that said, yeah, <laughs> law enforcement is a tough career. It's tough on you physically. It's tough on you mentally. It's tough on your family. It's, it's not easy. So I would, what I would say is that if I felt like I was somewhat called to do it, so Mm -hmm. I would say if you're just looking for a job and you think it'd be cool, no, don't do it. Right. But if you feel that it's a calling, absolutely. Um, Is it tough? Yeah. In 25 years, are you going to be ready to retire and kind of have the same kind of thoughts I did towards the end? Probably. Yeah. Um, But uh, I wouldn't say, no, don't do it because we need people to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I wouldn't say, oh yeah, it's the best thing in the world to jump right into it. Go into it with your eyes open and understand that it, it's not easy, but it's rewarding. And um, ultimately, you know, if it's a calling, you feel like that's what you're supposed to do, do it. Right. Yeah. Good, bro. Good. That's a lot of, a lot of information. Oh, we did the wrong one. Look at that. Oh, we got it on track. Yeah. Thanks, bro, for sharing. Yeah. I appreciate it. I know that was a lot. You did most of the talking, but. Oh, that's okay. Uh, it's fun. It's just something that, uh, over the last eight years, I haven't been able to really talk about because uh, right. policy, you know. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That's why we can't talk about agencies a lot and stuff. So, um, of course, we appreciate our sponsors, appreciate our patron members. Um, couldn't do it without them. Uh, but, uh, hey, if you uh, the way you want to support us is just through a flat donation. Well, you can certainly do that. Uh, we want to thank the following three people. Haven Morrison of Branson, Branson, Missouri. Carl Scholl, Sr. of Jacksonville, Florida. Joseph Wagner of Granite Falls, New York lawbindingbiker.com forward slash donate is how they do that. And there's on the website, there's a donate button. So 
we definitely never buck at a flat donation, guys. We really, really appreciate it very much. It's a good episode. Mm. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget, guys, all the cleaning products in the store. LawbindingBiker.com forward slash store. Mm-hmm. Get your bike all cleaned up with uh, the Bike Bright. Of course, the Bug Slide, our number one go-to waterless motorcycle cleaner. Bike Bright is our wet wash solution. Mm-hmm. Works awesome. Spray it on. Let it sit and watch those bugs and grime just melt right off. Yeah. Tried and tested both of them right here by the Law Abiding Biker crew. Mm-hmm. Got all kinds of stuff for you guys over in that store. We appreciate you shopping. It's another way you can support us. Thanks for listening.